Welcome back. So, um, I hope you enjoyed the midterm. Uh, that they've, no one's ever said yes to that. Um, word on the street was it's a little long. Don't worry about it. Everybody thought it was long. Um, a few people haven't taken it. There's a few makeups, so uh, we won't talk about it today. And please don't talk about it too much. But. Uh, uh, we'll give you. We'll try to be grading it over the break and get you responses pretty quick. But know that everybody thought it was a little long. So um, today, having survived the midterm, we get to go on to the next chapter, which is a super fun chapter, I guess, uh, of getting to walking robots. <clears throat> and it turns out, you know, not surprisingly, I'm going to uh, try to convince you that most of the stuff we've already been learning, there's just a few things we have to do to handle the walking robot case. Actually, walking robots are still just a bunch of pendula with a few motors, but not enough motors. Um, <clears throat> but there's really two big ideas that, that come into play uh, that haven't come in yet. And the first one of those is... Um, the first one is the idea of contact mechanics. So suddenly... where we've been used to thinking about vector fields, you know, the, the equations of motion that are smooth. You change Q a little bit, and Q double dot only changes a little bit. Um, now we're in a situation where you can actually collide with the ground. You can have uh, a lot of force generated in a little amount of time. Uh, and in practice, uh, the models that we're going to write down are not smooth. They, they might be that a, a slightly different, a small change in Q could give you a very different result in Q double dot. Um, <clears throat> so contact, is, you know, more generally it's about non-smooth mechanics. And the second thing that we're going to talk about um, today is that no longer is it going to be enough to just think about stabilizing, stabilizing a fixed point, right? So stabilizing a fixed point is fine for standing, but that's not what walking is all about. So since most of our tools have actually been built up about thinking about the long-term stability of something, we're going to have to extend that notion of stability to talk about richer behaviors, not just the stability of a fixed point. But in the case of walking, you might imagine, our goal might be to, to talk about the stability of a periodic motion, right? And that type of stability is called limit cycle stability, and we'll give you the basic tools of that today. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so 
the contact mechanics I really think is a big deal and, and um, you know it's, it's of course relevant for lots of, of problems beyond just walking uh, manipulation anytime you want to touch anytime the robot actually wants to do something in the world uh, besides just move around I mean a quadrotor sort of is the, the simple case but as soon as you're going to do mechanical work on the world you're probably going to reach out and touch it and and this idea of contact mechanics uh, is just incredibly important <coughs> Although it's only gotten popular in the last few years. It's sort of funny how, to see how long it's taken um, mainstream robotics to really re, uh, refocus on this again. But if you think about it, uh, there's a bunch of different ways that we could have gone from Pendula and cart poles and acrobats towards contact mechanics. So it's interesting to think maybe why did I pick walking first? Well, maybe I'm a walking guy and that's, that's true, but actually I'm, I'm thinking a lot about manipulation uh, these days. But still, if I want to tell you about the mechanics of manipulation, I would choose to start by talking about walking. And, and the reason is that um, simple models go very far in walking. We can actually capture a lot of the essence of the, all, all the interesting dynamics of a humanoid robot um, with some pretty simple devices, uh, you know, mechanical devices, and some pretty simple uh, models. And I think it, it actually, this notion of stability doesn't make as much sense for manipulation or it's a harder thing, but the, the story is somehow very clear and good in walking. And manipulation to me is actually maybe in some ways it's easier, but in some ways, in terms of the dynamics and control, it's a different, it's, a, it's the next phase after this. Um, and there really are some beautiful models that I think we can really understand. So I'm gonna do this um, by way of passive dynamic walking. So we'll, we'll add actuators soon, but the way to start is these models that I, um, I, I showed you even in the first lecture class, right? So this is, uh, the most impressive passive dynamic walker that's ever been built, in my opinion. Um, this is something by, built by Steve Collins, who's now faculty at uh, Stanford, uh, but he built this as his undergraduate research project. No pressure. Um, Andy Ruina uh, is an awesome, uh, uh, he's his advisor at the time. He's done many, many things, sort of pushing the field forward in dynamic walking. So, Again, this, this has got no motors, no controllers, put on top of a small ramp, give it a push, and it just falls down, powered only by gravity. And you can see, it really is a pretty small ramp. That's, there's really not a lot of uh, slope there, and it's enough to power the walker, right? And it falls into a, a stable gate that, in my mind, looks much more natural than Asimo, for instance. You know, from the back, it sort of looks like someone taking a stroll in the park. Right, so it does seem like those toys, and they really did start with toys, somehow capture maybe something fundamental about walking. And if you look back even a little bit farther, the way that happened, the person who started this, um, so in the history of walking, there were some, um, you know, actually relatively humanoid walking robots that were um, you know, moving extremely slowly. They would move their center mass over top the, the one foot, slowly lift their foot, you know, go like this, shift their center mass over the next foot. And there were some robots that were just sort of starting to do this. And then two things happened. One of them was um, Mark Raybert and the Leg Lab that was at Carnegie Mellon then moved to MIT, started building robots that hopped and threw themselves through the air, which I showed you a little bit of that before. And the other thing that happened is a guy named Tad McGear, who's actually an aerospace engineer, um, started building these passive dynamic walkers. And I think those were the biggest intellectual changes in the world that, that really, I think, had a big impact on making robots much more dynamic. So here's a video of Tad um, motivating passive dynamic walkers, okay? This familiar toy is a passive dynamic walker. With energy supplied by a falling weight, at the right start, it settles into a steady walking cycle sustained by an entirely passive interaction of gravity and inertia. This machine is also a passive dynamic walker. For that matter, I may be a passive dynamic walker. As you'll see, our gates are quite similar. The camera is running the day when the analysis and my intuition were brought conclusively into line. Oh God. 
Those few steps convinced us that we had the dynamics right. The reason the machine failed was a problem called knee bounds. So for later experiments, we went to a set of mechanical catches, and the next sequence shows our first trial with those. All right. So, did you see the year by that? By the way, that was uh, that was uh, April twentieth, nineteen ninety. Right. That's when this was all happening. Um, the mechanical catches he talked about for knee bounce. Uh, so it turns out they are suction cups that he puts on. You know, they put on top of the knee. So there's a little lever that goes up with a suction cup like this. When the knee goes straight, it goes. Okay, and then there's actually a hole poked in the back of the suction cup with a screw going into it, and you tune the leak rate of the suction cup. Right? So, so these things are, are, I mean, they look beautiful when they work, and they are a nightmare to tune. Uh, right? So, so, I mean, you could sit there, you, you know, you know, and, it, and uh, there's a lot of things that have to go to make that right. The curvature of the foot is just right. Uh, the friction in the joints has to be just right. The relative inertia, of course, have to be just right, and then. You're tuning the suction cup on the knee, okay? But you put it all together, and something beautiful comes out. The 3D walker, I think, I can only imagine was was even more. So um, Tad not only made some mechanical devices, but he also gave some of the initial simple analysis that really, um, really turned to be turned out to be pivotal and really affected a lot of people, both in the robotics community and in the biomechanics community. Um, another person who's contributed a lot is Art Quo, and he. He had, uh, I think, the most compelling simulation model of that walking robot, um, you know, a few years later. And, and really simple mathematical models that were just right out of the same way we're driving equations of motion, you put the curvature of the feet in, um, can capture what we saw in reality, okay? Uh, <clears throat> Tad introduced, actually, his first um, analysis was not on the full robot. In fact, it was much simpler than that. Um, he recommended that thinking about walking should actually start with the analysis of a wheel, where you take the wheel, but you take the rim away from the wheel, and you're left with a hub and a bunch of spokes. And that actually the rimless wheel is maybe the simplest walking robot. So we're going to spend a little bit of time um, Simulate pi. Thinking about the dynamics of a rimless wheel. Okay, so um, sorry that my horizontal projection of a cylinder is a bounding box and looks a little silly there, but um, if you ignore that for a second, if you take a rimless wheel, put it on the top of a small ramp, and give it a push, then what happens? Okay, it turns out uh, there's two basic dynamics which we'll go into. One is you, as you move down the ramp, your center of mass moves down the ramp, and you gain a little bit of energy, or rather you convert some potential energy into kinetic energy, okay? But something else happens. Every time your spoke comes around and hits the ground, given you're gonna lose a little bit of energy. You're gonna dissipate some energy into the ground, okay? Those things could potentially balance, and in fact, they do balance, and what's really amazing is that they become, it, become, it produces a stable system. So if you start speed, if you run too fast, it'll slow down. If you start too slow, it'll speed up. And there's a stable periodic solution of that system, which is rolling forward. Okay, and that is maybe the simplest example of stability in a walking robot that we're going to find. We're going to be able to understand everything about it, uh, and then we'll move on from to more complicated systems. Okay, so let's think first about limit cycle stability, and then we'll throw in some contact mechanics. Um, so let's, even before we get into the, the full rimless wheel, um, we could do limit cycle stability without any impacts. So take any, um, any sort of system that has a periodic solution, right? So one of the classical um, oscillators is the Vanderpool oscillator. It's uh, 
second order system with pretty simple dynamics, which happen to be polynomial. Remember, I mentioned this once before when we were plotting reasons of attraction. Okay. So if you look at this and squint, and you, if you thought, certainly if you thought about linear dynamical systems, um, well, if I were to hide that for a second, then you'll see, you see a, a linear spring mass uh, system. Okay. So if I put that back, then maybe one way to think about that is a spring mass system, which you could you know could could oscillate um, with some sort of a nonlinear damping. And in fact, that's a pretty healthy way to think about it. So um, that's probably the right way to think about it. So if I had a simple spring mass system, a linear spring mass model, and I plotted Q versus Q dot, then you know the undamped system is going to could give me um, solutions that look like this, that go around in uh, state space like that. And then if I start putting in damping, I might get solutions that look like this. Okay, this is with damping. And if my, or if I somehow, for some reason, did negative damping, um, then I could get systems that blow up out. This would be, uh, I guess, it's weird to call it negative damping, but positive feedback, right? And that's all that a linear system can do, right? It's, it, it could have these um, marginally stable periodic orbits, but it doesn't have anything that we would call a limit cycle in sense, I'm going to define limit cycle in a second, but these things are not stable orbits. The undamped pendulum or, or undamped, any linear undamped system, um, I could get unstable um, periodic solutions, but not stable. I can get a fixed point that's stable, or I can get a system that's unstable, but that's all a linear system can do. So now if I look at the Van der Poel oscillator, I've added some nonlinearity, and so you could imagine something richer could happen. If you think about it, when Q is small, then this, um, this thing is going to be negative, and it's like I have negative damping. So it's going to blow up towards the outside. When Q gets big, then I have positive damping, and it's going to pull myself back towards the origin. And those two couple so that when I'm here near the origin, zero is still zero, but once I get away from the origin a little bit, I'll actually go out. But at some point, when I get big enough with Q, these things start to balance, and it actually falls into a, a stable periodic solution, okay? Similarly, if I'm outside of that particular solution, then I have damping, and it actually will come down and go to the same periodic solution, okay? So it's just well known about the Van der Poel oscillator that there's this sort of oblong, um, periodic solution in state space. Okay. And all trajectories, except for the, the zero point, zero is still a fixed point, every other, every other initial condition will end up in a periodic solution. Okay. So then the next question is, um, how do we talk about the long-term behavior of that system? I mean, I, I just described it in words, but if I want to have a Lyapunov function that says I, I'm going to converge to that, that periodic solution, if I want to um, you know, design a controller that's going to somehow stabilize that long-term solution, then I need a slightly different language than anything we've done so far. 
And the reason is this. So we've talked a little bit about stability of a, um, of a trajectory. If I had an infinite trajectory, I can talk about converging to the trajectory. <coughs> So if I had um, x of t divined for all t greater than zero, okay, then I could talk about stability of that trajectory. For instance, maybe I call this my my nominal trajectory x star here, or my my fixed trajectory that I'm trying to converge to. Then I could talk about, for instance, the limit as time goes to infinity of xt minus x star t. And I'd like that if I could, if that goes to zero, then, um, let me write, if that goes to zero or the limit is equal to zero, right, then I'm happy to say that that's a, that um, the system, this trajectory is stable. So is the, periodic solution of the van der Poel oscillator a stable trajectory? It's not. And here's a simple counterexample. Consider two initial conditions here and here. Right? Are they ever going to go to the same place? Right? So all trajectories in that definition should eventually be going on some nominal, you know, they should converge to zero, right? But these two initial conditions are never going to, if I, if I were to define my periodic trajectory starting here and move along, right? And then I'd say this is a different xt, does it converge to the original trajectory? The answer is no, it never converges, right? Because at, if you look at any particular in t instant in time, this is in a different place on that cycle than this one. So by that definition, it is not stable in a sense of a trajectory. Okay? So limit cycle stability it captures this slightly more complicated um, analysis, right? So a periodic trajectory so I'd like x star t to be equal to x star t plus tau. All right, I'd like to have it be periodic. Um, it's going to be stable, is limit cycle stable? If I need something a little bit better than this, and the little bit better thing is I'm going to say minimum over tau x of t minus x star So what does that mean in pictures here, right? It means that the definition, the thing that I want to go to zero is that there's a, some periodic solution. I'm allowed at every, inst at every state I'm concerned with, if x of t is here, I don't need to match anything in time. I'm willing to take the shortest, the closest point on that trajectory, okay? The trajectory is, a, is a, some orbit in, in state space here. And all I care about is that the distance, the shortest distance between my points and the um, periodic solution go to zero. Okay, so the minimum over tau, I'm allowed to search along the trajectory for the closest point. That's the closest point. That distance has to go to zero. Yeah? And this is the, the fundamental definition of limit cycle stability. It's also sometimes called orbital stability. Okay. 
once we are equipped with that, then a lot of our thinking about Lyapunov and, and fixed points and, and even bifurcations and the like is going gonna, is gonna to map right over to walking robots. The rimless wheel, for instance, is stable in the sense of a limit cycle, but is not stable in the sense of a trajectory. If I start it in two different places along its solution path, those two places will never catch up with each other in time, but of course that periodic solution is stable. Okay, so um, this is, looks like a harder thing to think about. I mean, there's some, now it, it turned from a pretty simple quantity that we could, we could bound to somehow this is a search over tau. Um, how are we gonna actually use that in, in, our, uh, in our analysis? Well, it turns out there's a, um, a beautiful, sufficient condition for proving, uh, for uh, verifying uh, limit cycle stability, and it's due to Poincaré, right? So it's something called a Poincaré map. How many people have heard of Poincaré maps before? Yeah? Okay. Um, the idea is very simple. Let me draw it again since... If I have some periodic solution here, and I'd like to, to understand that that is um, stable in the sense of a, a limit cycle stability, it turns out it's sufficient to talk about just one point on that trajectory, or rather one, um, one sort of location in state space here. Imagine you have some surface here that's de defined only in the positive orthant here, but maybe all the way up to infinity, okay? We'll call this thing a surface of section. Not my name, but that's the name, okay? And what I'm gonna do is instead of analyzing every point on state space, in the state space, if I can say that I found some surface of section, some plane, some, you know, some defining feature in the, in the state space, such that all trajectories will eventually pass through this, and trajectories that start on this will return to it, then actually just looking at this sort of portal, this one subset, the snapshot of, of the dynamics, I can infer something about the entire solution. Okay, so in the particular, um, you know, for the Van der Poel oscillator, if I have solutions that start here, go here, okay, turns out if I just look at the system that's defined by the jump, you know, it's now going to be a discrete thing. It starts with an initial condition here, on the next step it's here, on the next step it's here, on the next step it's here. If I can couple that with a guarantee that the map is well defined, that if I started here, I'm gonna always return. Then in fact, if these points on this iterated map converge to a fixed point on the map, then it implies, given some smoothness assumptions about this, that, that the original system had to have converged to a limit cycle in the original space. That's the big idea, okay? If I can find a surface of section and the, uh, and define this now iterated map on the surface of section, if that map converges to a fixed point, then a fixed point on the surface of section is a limit cycle in the original space, okay? All right, so if I have a, um, if X is in Rn, if I got an n-dimensional state space, then my surface of section actually lives in n minus one. So if I'm 32 dimensions, I need to find a 30 to one dimensional half space so it's like this, okay. Um, it needs to be transverse to the flow. What does that mean and why does that have to happen, right? What if I were, if my vector field were to be going along 
that surface of section that sort of violates my discrete map stuff. So, uh, so the transversality condition says that if I draw the vector field along the flow, it has to be pointing out of that surface of section. You don't stay on the surface of section. You pass through it. Okay, so the section has to be transverse to the flow. And all trajectories that start on the section return to the section. If you have that, this is um, the surface of section, or the dynamics on the surface of section now are a discrete dynamic. I'm going to call it XP, n plus 1. This is the n minus, the n, um, minus 1 dimensional um, location on that surface of section. It's a map that takes me from wherever I was on this step to the next step. And you can think of that as just a discrete time system. Okay? This map, I call it the P because it's the Poincaré map. It's the dynamics from the surface of section to the next time. It's a map from the surface to itself. So in the Vanderpoel oscillator, the, the choice here is I'm going to define the surface of section as just being um, Q equals zero and Q dot greater than zero. Make sense? Yeah? Super simple idea. Good that somebody who was being careful about it proved that, that the implication on the map says something about the n-dimensional space. There's some subtlety there, but those are subtleties that have been taken care of for us. Um, but something big happened, okay? Suddenly the stability of a limit cycle, which seems hard to think about, just turned back into the, the problem of the stability of a fixed point, and we know a lot about that. Right? A fixed point on the map is a limit cycle on the original space. It is a discrete map, not a continuous map. Wow. So, so the reason I like um, Vanderpool Oscillator, I'm going to like the rimless wheel, is that this is actually, since that's a two-dimensional space originally, um, theta versus theta dot, the surface of section is just a one-dimensional thing. And I can do my, just like we did our graphical analysis on the line before, I can do graphical analysis here to understand the, these limit cycles. Yeah? The notions of regions of attraction uh, and invariant sets and those things are all going to map over pretty nicely. Yeah, but we're going to even. Uh, it turns out the computing. For, there's, yeah, there's a longer version of that. I'll get to. The 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 quick foreshadowing of that is that the only problem with the, the Poincaré analysis is that it's often hard to do to get p analytically. So I, I mean, um, if, if the limit cycle is a is a an invariant set, can we do we need Poincaré maps for the limit cycle of an invariant set? Therefore, it's stable in the sense of what converted to zero. I see. Um, good. So, so there's there's a couple of subtle reasons for that. So, if we could, so one thing is that um, in the pendulum example, which is I think maybe what where we talked about something very similar to that. One of the nice things was we had a uh, analytical solution for that cycle. Right? It was the, constant, the curve of constant energy, and I had a very simple closed form solution for that. I don't have any analytical description of that curve. It's the numerical integration 
or it's, it's the integration, which I only know how to do numerically, of the second order differential equations, okay? So I can do this analysis even if I don't have the analytical solution of the limit cycle. And in practice, um, there's gonna be other reasons why this is gonna be possible in many cases where the original analysis is not. It's true that if I could talk about stability in the way we did before to the cycle, we, some of those tools did work. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's draw the, um, the Poincaré map of the Vanderpool oscillator. Okay, so now this is xp at n versus xp at n plus one. So this is the Okay, so um, it's only defined for sort of positive x's, the way I've defined it so far. But for any positive x, um, so if I have a small, some small x, then on the next step, not the right one to look at here, if I started here, um, for some small x, you know, close to zero, on the next step, I'm gonna get a bigger x out, okay? So if I wanna think about bigger than, so I need to draw the line of slope one. So when x is small, well first of all zero, it's zero. It doesn't actually leave. If I'm at the fixed point, that's sort of a, a singularity in this map. We would we defined it only at, as, as really greater than that, okay? But after this, that for small xp's, on the next step, it's gonna be larger, right? If I, were, if I were to have a point right here on the line, that would be that x, uh, xp n plus one is the same as xp, but we know it's bigger. And in fact, if you plot it for a few of these, it looks sort of like this. As I get up to larger and larger, it's gonna start converging here so that xp being this, it goes around, it's gonna come back to the same value, which gives me a point right on the on the one one line, okay? And then if I go up farther, then actually each return to the map is gonna be smaller than the original value. So I get something that looks like this. And if you plot it, plot the Poincaré map of the Vanderpool oscillator, you get a, a line like this. Okay? Now just like our graphical analysis of the sine wave and, and the aught taps and, and things like this, the pictures actually tell us a lot about what's happening, right? So first of all, this point where, every, any point where it crosses uh, the line of slope one is a fixed point. Now the statement about this being greater and this being less suggests that this is probably a stable fixed point you have to be a little careful because iterated maps can jump, um, right? So if you think about the way things progress, the, f the, the examples we had of like um, in continuous time, x versus x dot, right? If I had a curve like this, then I know this one's going this way, this one's going this way, and it'll definitely converge here. The dynamics on a map are a little bit more complicated. Things jump, right? So if I were to start here, then the way you, you follow that is that you actually, you bring it up, there's a kind of a graphical iterated map idea. You, you bring it up to the value here, and then if you wanna bring that to the next value, you would project that to the line of slope one, and then you go up to this, line of slope one, and you can sort of do this iterated map Um, analysis, okay? But it is the case that, uh, you know, that this being above the line of slope one means I'm going up. This one, if I were to start way up here, then it goes to here, then to here, then to here, then to here, 
So we'd like to say that's a stable fixed point, right? If you were to plot, if you could, you could, if you start playing with these, and we're not going to—it's not a big topic of the class, but it's, it's a fun thing to think about here. But um, if you, for instance, have negative slope, then it'll jump back and forth. It can go around and around in circle. So it's not quite as simple to think about as the continuous time flows. But many of the things we have do work. Okay. Um, similarly, you can talk about local stability of this. So the fixed point is x star equals p x star, right, where you get the same thing back out. And you can do local stability via linearization. By looking at partial p, partial x, you can come up with a linear map, which would look like xn plus 1 equals a of xn in the vicinity of a fixed point. And you can ask about the, stable, the eigenvalues of a in order to say something about the stability locally. Okay, The eigenvalues in the discrete time system need to be less than or equal to 1. Absolute value, right? Not negative, but the, point, the, the only point I need you to understand is that linear, local linearization is sufficient to understand stabi local stability of this. And then, again, we can use the Apanov analysis suddenly on this, on P, to say something about the, the resulting stability in the original dynamics. Very, very nice, very powerful idea. Okay? So uh, let me just plant that seed a little bit that we were, that I thought Philip was asking about. One of the limitations as we go forward, we're, for today's lecture, we're going to be able to write down Poincaré maps and analyze them. But that's going to break down when you get to more complicated robots, because it's very hard to um, have a closed form solution of the integration from one cycle to the next. And there, so therefore, you end up doing either numerical Poincaré analysis or do some approximations. Um, one of the tools that we're going to build later, and just I'm just going to mention it now because I can plant the seed and because I've got a picture on the board that helps me. There's a notion, if you think of the, about this as some um, transverse map, right? Um, it's a Poincaré section. There's a notion we're going to get to later of a moving Poincaré section. That if you can say something not only about this section, but also a whole family of sections that moves along the limit cycle. If you could say something about the whole, you know, the, the local behavior along a whole family of Poincaré sections, of moving Poincaré sections, then we're going to be able to say something in, you know, even if we cannot integrate the numerics. So this is a stationary Poincaré section, but we're going to do moving Poincaré sections in a lecture or two. Yeah? It's also going to be a key idea for stabilization. Remember the thing we talked about in trajectory optimization and trajectory stabilization? The annoying thing that if I do trajectory, the time varying LQR or MPC in those formulations, if the, if the glider got behind, it would be trying to catch up to the time. Or if it got ahead, it would actually be trying to slow down in time. Can't you imagine now that if I were to somehow define the stability in terms of Poincaré sections instead of in terms of the original coordinates, that maybe that's going to be our solution. That what we actually wanted in the, pen, in the even the perching is something more like orbital stability. And in walking, it really is stability because it's infinite horizon. Okay? So this idea is going to go a long way for us, but I think the, today we're just going to do the simplest version, the, the stationary Poincaré section. That's the basic idea of limit cycle stability. Does that make sense? So the next part is contact mechanics. And then we're going to put them all together and understand uh, the, all the simple walkers. Okay. All right. 
Let's do some basic contact modeling. All right, so um, in the rimless wheel, the most interesting event is you know, this foot, once it's on the ground, is sort of okay. Maybe you can even just think of it as a pin joint. In fact, we'll model it that way. So that's kind of like just a pendulum right there. But it's a particular pendulum which, as it moves around, at some point, this foot is going to collide with the ground. And something happens that we have to model. Okay? There's a, um, you know, a couple, couple ways to model impact. Um, there are typically, they're typically divided into either stiff models or um, sort of, yeah, either stiff models, stiff versus soft contact. Soft contact could be, for instance, a spring model, spring damper model. where I have a robot's foot, let's say, that's a really lame robot foot, but okay, and I have the ground, then I've got a few points that I'm gonna model, and what I care about is the distance to the ground, and the interesting case, I guess, is when the robot's foot is in the ground, then if I were to zoom in, I should have made that way bigger. Big foot now. I could model the forces I get on the ground as some spring that's pulling me up back towards the ground, and maybe there's a damper there too. Okay, these are the sort of, for instance, my ground reaction forces which I typically will call a ground reaction force lambda, um, in the normal direction might be something like negative k, uh, distance below the ground. Maybe some, plus some damping. Okay, so putting a sp uh, effective spring between your foot and the ground, that is, the forces are zero when you're up here, but once I'm in penetration, I get some, some linear response. That's actually a pretty good model of, of, uh, of contact, right? We'll, put, so we'll have to do a little bit more work to put friction on the other side. That's a pretty good model of contact. But it's hell on analysis, because in order to, to have a humanoid standing on the ground, uh, I need to make K very, very big. Right? Otherwise, I'm going to have a nice dynamics where the robot's like sagging into the ground and it's, uh, it's, it's not very good on the eyes and it's not very good uh, for reproducing physical reality. And if I do choose to make a differential equation that has you know, some terms that are typically pretty small, derivatives that are pretty small here, and then suddenly, as soon as I cross this threshold, suddenly the numbers get very, very big, then I end up with a stiff differential equation. And that turns out to be sometimes okay for simulation, but very bad for optimization and, and closed form analysis, okay? Um, <clears throat> all right, so the other approach here, ironically, the, um, is, is to say I have non-penetration, strict non-penetration. This, in some ways, is uh, so rigid contact, I, mean, I, should, I should really call this rigid instead of stiff. Because that leads to a stiff differential equation. I don't want to confuse those two for you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> strict non-penetration says that my foot never goes under the ground. And that's actually sort of a bad approximation. We always have some compliance at our, at our, uh, wherever we touch the ground. Okay. Um, so what happens then is, my dynamics of my foot as I'm coming towards the ground, I have zero contact forces, 
And then I have, at the moment my foot touches the ground, it'll never go through, in order to bring the system to rest in a finite amount of time, in zero time, right, I have to have an impulse. But then, once I'm on the ground, I can compute whatever forces are required to, set it, to make sure that I never go through the ground. And it's a well-defined system again. It turns out that these, although they're, I, I view them as a worse model of, of reality, they tend to be better for uh, both numerical analysis and uh, board work. Okay. So for the rimless wheel, <coughs> we're going to model it with rigid contact. Okay. So here's my model. I'm going to put it on a ramp of slope gamma. I'm going to have a rimless wheel that looks like this. Okay. The angle here is what I'll call theta. It's got a mass. Um, it's a point mass. The angle between these two spokes, I'm going to write it actually as 2 alpha. You'll see why. It'll save me some writing later. Okay. And the length of the, of the spokes we'll call L. Okay. And the modeling assumptions that are going to make this really nice are going to be, first, no slip. So I'm going to assume that the whatever foot is already on the ground, that I can model that as a pin joint. Okay. And then my collisions, I'm going to say, are inelastic and impulsive. Impulse, impulsive is the same thing I just talked about there. I'm going to say that when the foot hits the ground, there's an instantaneous force which keeps it from going into the ground. And then inelastic says I'm not going to bounce. All of my energy that's going into the ground is going to be dissipated into the ground. It's not going to bounce back. Okay. And then one more assumption here is that I'm going to have no double support. That the moment that this foot hits the ground, this foot releases from the ground. And I'll, I'm going to make that assumption in the models, and then in practice we need to check to make sure that when I leave the ground, my model's only going to be valid if when I leave the ground this thing starts rotating up. If it ever started going down, I violated that assumption. But we're going to find out that for mo in, in all the cases of interest, that's going to be fine. That at the moment this happens, this foot's going to start rotating away from the ground. Okay. So you see now I have exactly the equations of a pendulum. Like really, I've got a point mass here. These spokes add no extra mass. So they are exactly the equations of the simple pendulum. While the system is, is moving through space like this. And then I have one new set of equations, which is when that foot hits the ground. I'm going to do two things. I'm going to, first of all, take some energy out of the system that's, going in, that's being imparted in the ground. And I'm actually going to move the pin joint from here over to here, reset my coordinate system, and then keep going with the pendulum equations. Okay. If you do that, then the result is really beautiful. So of course we've got um, you know, the original undamped pendulum vector field. 
I've defined zero uh, to be here in the upright configuration, not the downright configuration. Otherwise, I'm going to be adding pi a lot. Okay, so it's it's the zero here is at the what we normally think of as pi in the in the pendulum example. Okay, and there's two important um, lines here. There's sort of the angle of the ground relative to the angle of the leg. It turns out the collisions happen at these lines here where this is at gamma plus alpha and this is at gamma minus alpha. Okay, so the geometry works out that the only thing that matters about where you collide with the ground is the relative, is, is the slope of the ground, of course, and then the distance between your spokes. So if I start the system in some initial condition, which is tipping over, let's say, with some velocity, then this follows the passive dynamics of the pendulum. So it, it does this the same way it does, and it used to, until it hits this, has a collision, Two things happen. I'm going to lose energy, which in this case means I'm going to move down in velocity. And I'm going to reset my coordinate system so that that leg is now over at the other side of the, you know, it's now the takeoff leg. All right, so this is the line where my foot's going on this side. You can just figure out what the angle is there. And this, the other line is the one where I'm up here on the ramp, okay? So it's going to do two things. It's going to get reset over to here and it's going to drop down. I'm going to and then you can simulate it again, and it'll do something else, okay, until it goes like this. And what you're going to see, if you simulate it forward, my claim, is that this is going to fall into a stable limit cycle behavior, where if it's slower than this, it'll speed up, if it's faster than this, it'll slow down, and it'll go to the stable limit cycle. It's now a hybrid limit cycle because of these hybrid dynamics, okay? hybrid for discrete and continuous. There's no uh, batteries or gas here, right? And the amazing thing is we're gonna, um, we have, because it's just the pendulum, we can solve everything about that. Okay, that's the picture. Let's do it. So we know the dynamics of, in the, of the pendulum already. I don't, I'm not going to write that down, but let's think about what the dynamics of the collision are. This inelastic collision. So this is happening at the moment where I've got theta here and now I'm just, this is just about to come into the contact with the ground, okay? So inelastic means that all energy going into the ground is lost. Another way to say that, and the more actionable way to say that, is the angular momentum around the point of collision is the only thing that's conserved. Energy is no longer conserved, but at the point of collision, there's forces acting here, but the angular momentum around that is conserved, okay?
Okay, so how do you write the angular momentum? Well, I've got the mass here. It's got an instantaneous velocity v. I want to take it, I want to write the angular momentum around here. I, I know the velocity relative, I should actually be a little bit more careful here. So before contact, before collision, the, angle, the velocity of this thing has got to be, since it's just a pendulum here, has got to be at a right angle uh, with the, the, the leg that's in, in uh, that's a pin joint, right? The arc is going like this, so the velocity of this is a vector that is orthogonal to that line, to the leg. Right? That's just true of a pendulum. After collision, that's also going to be true. After collision, I'm going to be, my velocity is going to be on a line, which has got to be at a right angle compared to the new stance leg. Okay? So this, I'm going to call this original one V minus. I'm going to call this new one V plus. And it turns out that the the way to find out what v plus is relative to v minus is it's going to the it's going to be exactly this sort of right angle here. Geometrically, it works out to be that right angle, where this is the work done by um, by the collision. It takes away all of the energy going into the ground, and it gives me exactly the, the resulting velocity afterwards. Okay. So my angular momentum before collision, I'm just going to use at t minus, oh. shorthand, okay, is my L cross mv minus. And in of course, I'm going to have L plus is L cross MV plus. Those two are going to be, um, going to have to be equal. This one works out to be ML squared theta dot times cosine of two alpha. The length, the magnitude of that, uh, you know, the total angular momentum around this point before collision works out to be ml squared theta dot 2 alpha. This one turns out to be, this is theta dot minus. And this one is ml squared theta dot plus. So this gives me a, just by writing the angular momentum relation around that fixed point, I can figure out what theta dot plus is has got to be just theta dot minus cosine of 2 alpha. So in this simple case, just looking at the angular momentum around that single point of collision, this completely tells me what um, theta dot plus is, what the velocity is after the impact in the, unit, in the general coordinates relative to the velocity before the impact. Okay. Now let's just run this through our basic um, ideas here. So uh, does this make sense? So first of all, cosine's always going to be less than one, so I'm going to always lose energy. What's the limit of where this equals um, has no losses? What, what's that? Yeah? So as alpha goes to zero, yeah? And that's the wheel, right? So as those spokes get arbitrarily close together, the losses go to zero, and I've got a wheel. So that's good sanity check. What's the other extreme? Well, negative doesn't really make sense. You'll, you'll see why. What happens if alpha is just pi over two? Now I've got a box, right? And if I lose all my energy, it's just, it's one and you're, you're one and done. Boom, you know, you, as soon as you ro rotate over, you're not rolling anymore. Okay? So that equation checks with their intuition. All right. 
So it's pretty beautiful. We can play around with it a little bit. And what I, if you just put those equations in uh, to your simulator, there is a little bit of work uh, on the, the way you integrate this. You actually, in order to integrate hybrid models, um, the back end uh, in Drake, but in, or in, um, if, you, if you can set it up in MATLAB to do this too, you have to do event detection. So you're actually gonna simulate a differential equation with some event detection, watching for the, co the condition when the foot penetrates the ground. The simulator will then back up, find exactly the instant when the, the, um, the collision event happens, up to numeric precision. And then we apply the discrete update. We're just gonna change theta dot mi minus into theta dot plus. And then we restart the simulation and go keep going forward. A hybrid numerical integration routine will do that for you. And uh, you know, so we've built up that in, in uh, in Drake, so you could just say, "Here's a hybrid event," and it'll simulate through that. And uh, that's what I, sh you know, showed you here. This is the nominal, some nominal initial condition where the system goes rolling and it falls into this stable periodic solution. What's amazing, though, is actually how stable it is. So, first of all, if I were to set it starting, started up going like really fast, it slows down and falls into that same limit cycle. So that's starting up way up here, and it's going bam, 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 and then right here, right? If I started going a little slower, I'm not sure why I picked 0.95 exactly, but here we go. Then it's starting down here. I'm start, always starting it up at the upright, and I'm just starting it with slightly different velocities here. Then it actually, speeds up, boom, 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 and goes up to the fixed point, okay? It's interesting if you start it down here, what happens? The map is well-defined, okay? Uh, I start it with negative five velocity. Okay, so that one went from here, it went wham, wham, and it actually got caught in this fixed point here where it's going, there's an orbit that goes like this, right? It goes doom, 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 doom. And although the system, I said there is no double support in the system, that simulation, as the time goes to infinity, has infinitely frequent collisions going da, 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 arbitrarily close, and it stands still like this, okay? And it's trapped inside here. But what's really interesting is because of this asymmetry, right? This line was, is the half angle of the legs, but then it's shifted this way by the slope, the ramp. So as I shift it this way, I get an asymmetry. So you can actually have a system here that goes like this, lands over here, and it'll actually jump up as it goes around. It'll jump up to the uh, higher, uh, to, to rolling forward. So let me, so I just did ra negative five radians per second, but if I put in negative 4.8 radians per second, almost exactly the simulation I just showed you, then something different happens. And it goes back and it starts rolling forward. Okay? And it all falls out completely from that simple set of equations. And the way to see it, is that you can actually write out the closed form, and I do in the notes, write out the closed form solution of theta as it goes through that upper, uh, so the analysis that I, that I'm gonna, that I do here is plotting um, the return map. I actually choose a surface of section to be like this, and I also put this one on there as, a, that, that, as one surface of section, and I say from where it's going here, where does it land on the next, point here, you can write that map out in closed form. It's just energy balance, right? The path here is, I know exactly in closed form, there's another point that has the same energy as this over here, and then I can certainly multiply that resulting velocity by cosine of two alpha to find my next map. Right? You can just write that out in closed form. And the plot that emerges is sort of beautiful and good. Okay. This is the discrete, the iterated, you know, Poincaré map of the rimless wheel. The angle of the original velocity after collision n 
and the velocity after collision n plus one. Okay? There are two fixed points, the two places it crosses the line of slope one. One of them is a rolling fixed point. The other one is the standing fixed point. And actually we can, uh, in this you will march forward and we can actually prove what the regions of attraction of those fixed points are. The region of attraction of the rolling fixed point is the light blue. And the region of attraction of the standing fixed point is the white. Okay, so it turns out that for arbitrary positive velocities over some critical threshold, what's that threshold? So it's, remember, it's, it's, I'm starting here and going up. So there's some critical threshold where I actually go over the top. As long as I go over the top, then I'll keep rolling forward, okay? But if I don't go over the top, then I'll fall back down and end up in the standing fixed point. That's the region between zero and that green line, okay? If I make it over the top, then no matter how fast I start, I'm always gonna slow down and come to the rolling fixed point. The interesting case is going backwards here, where if I go back up and not, so green again is going over the top. I take a step backwards, okay? But if I get to the point where I don't quite go over the top, I can still come back with enough energy to go over the top forward. That's this little band of blue here. And if I did take a step backwards, I could take a few steps backwards. And again, there's always a case where, it, depending on if I could go over the top or just if I go just barely not quite over the top, then no matter how many steps I took backwards, I could eventually roll forward again. And the size of that region that will catch actually gets a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger as it goes forward because of the contraction uh, that, that the dissipation gives. Okay, so this is not numerical, this is closed form. Those blue lines are all closed form, and then we can write down exactly, we can solve exactly for what those light blue regions are. And we have a complete understanding of the, the dynamics of the rimless wheel. And that is the last walking robot you will ever have complete understanding of in that, you know, in that clarity, but it's awesome to, to have that at least once. All right, questions about the rimless wheel? The cool thing is it's not a dead end, right? So you can go straight from the, the rimless wheel to just a slightly more complicated model. That slightly more complicated model is a compass gate. So how do you make it slightly more complicated? Um, I wanna take this, but I now wanna have a pin joint here instead of, uh, instead of just a, a fixed spokes, right? Now, if, I have to, if I'm gonna have a pin joint there in order to have the dynamics of the leg make sense, I, I need to put some mass on the leg. So the next most minimal model is the compass gate. It's gonna look almost exactly the same. I, I use the same variables in the notes and everything like this, okay? I've got a, still my point mass at the hip, but I'm gonna add a little bit of mass in the two legs. This is theta one, now this is gonna be theta two, the relative leg angle. And it's just gonna, I'm gonna assume that's a passive joint, no damping, okay? It turns out if you take that same compass gate, you put it on the ramp, you give it a little push, guess what? Now you get something that looks a little bit more like a walking robot. It still has a, a limit cycle, a periodic solution, and that limit cycle is locally stable. The rimless wheel was like seriously stable. You know, up to that, those, those two points, you know, they covered the entire space, but the rolling fixed point had a very large region of attraction. This one has an itty bitty little teeny uh, region of attraction, unfortunately. Uh, we did some numerics to, to figure it out before. Well, first of all, let's see. This is, the, uh, this is what that limit cycle looks like. This is a little, a little bit confusing, but I want you to see the basic ideas, is that if you were to look at only the stance leg, then the, the, the well, sorry, if you track, this, let's see, this is the rimless wheel, okay, the red line. It's almost exactly the same thing that we did before. 
We had the same arc. It's upside down in that picture because I, fl I, I flipped the angle, but that's this arc right here. When I have uh, my foot hits the ground, I have a discontinuous event where I lose velocity. Going over here, I lose velocity, okay? But then one other thing happens is my, the leg that I was just following there turns into the swing leg. And when it's a swing leg, it goes through that beautiful blue arc, okay, until it has another collision with the ground, and then it loses some energy, and it becomes a stance leg. So it's almost exactly the same thing, but that same leg as I track it does both the stance in red and the swing in blue. And they're punctuated by those two discrete events. Okay, And that limit cycle is also stable, but just barely. If you plot it, like this is what the, this is, if you go through and numerically search on the Poincaré map, run lots and lots of simulations with event detection and everything like this, and you look at what are the initial radians per second of, the, of this that, that sort of result in convergence to that equilibrium. I mean, this part is sort of reasonable, okay, and uh, you know, I could fit a circle in there, maybe I'd be happy with it, but there's these weird, you know, it starts getting ugly. So it's much, much numerically harder. And it only gets worse, uh, you know, from there. At least for the passive walkers. The goal, of course, is to add control back and make that bigger. And we're going to do that. Okay, the cool thing is you can keep going, and this is now uh, the need compass gate, where I've got a little bit bigger mass on the hip, uh, as I, and I put a, another, uh, another mass on the, shank, uh, the lower leg, and uh, I give that a push. It can walk stably down. Its region of attraction is even smaller, like really. We tried to build this, and uh, it was a nightmare. The, the point foot version. The one with the curve feet you can build and with enough suction cup tuning, it's all good. Trying to make it work with point feet is, um, it's hard, it's hard. We had, yeah? Is there a limit for the angle between legs? Good. Oh, between the legs, um, actually not. So uh, that, that can go arbitrarily, but there is a collision at the knee. There's a kneecap. So if you watch carefully, I have, I have to model two hybrid events. It actually smacks into that uh, into the, the kneecap, and then will be locked as it goes down. But the hip could go arbitrarily fa far, and if you were to simulate this from mildly different initial conditions, you would see that going pretty far. And if you were to have been in the lab when we were building these things, you would have seen, first of all, the mass that you need here compared to here puts you in a, a design space where you're building like huge aluminum, uh, you know, with like, you know, lead, uh, you know, uh, things attached to it on the top, and then little laser cut, uh, you know, plastic molded lower legs, and then failure mode not only means the robot falls down, but typically something explodes because you've, you've, you've got a little light lower leg, uh, yeah, not so good. The region of a, or sorry, the limit cycle of this looks almost the same as the compass gate, not surprisingly. But it's got one extra event, which is when the um, knee strikes the leg. Okay, so um, you know this is our first foray into uh, to walking. Uh, we'll do we'll do running also. But let me just back up and say that these simple models, I think, not only provide a ton of clarity uh, and bring our dynamics sort of towards walking. But it's, they've actually given a lot of little insights too into the um, into the dynamics of even human walking. Okay, so um, this picture that I had drawn somewhere of the angular momentum before and after, right? This notion that when I'm walking, whether I'm walking on the flat or on the ramp, that I'm going to go from here to here and I'm going to lose this energy, right? Um, this is my velocity minus, my velocity plus, this is my loss. There's a little lesson that came out of that, which is that if you wanted to build a very efficient walking robot, what, would you, what should you try to do? Right? If I had, if I had a little um, actuation and, and I, where would I, you know, where could you put it to somehow make your robot more efficient? Turns out one of the most efficient walking robots, which Andy Ruina um, has built following on this work, is, uh, is incredibly efficient, and in, in, the, in the, even the simple models can be like four times more efficient 
If you, uh, uh, if you just, meaning it could walk down a four times smaller ramp, if you just apply a little impulse at the back foot at just the right time, okay? So the picture there is that if I'm going forward, one of the most efficient times to add energy is right before my, the instant before contact, if I push off with my back toe, then I could take my angular momentum, which is currently going just in an arc around my back foot, give it a little velocity up, like this, if I'm pushing off the ground, and incur then a loss that's only this big. Okay? So this has been, you know, the simple models. Yielded sort of simple insights, in, which have worked on physical robot. In particular, there's a nice paper that says like um, you can be four times more efficient with a little bit of toe off. There's other sort of simple less, um, sort of lessons that came out of the simple models of walking that have been really useful. In fact, um, if you think about how Atlas is being controlled today, you know, at Boston Dynamics, for instance, they do a lot of their thinking in terms of these simple models. And you can think about being stable by just thinking about where you put your foot. Okay, and that comes out of just thinking about these pogo stick or, or um, compass gate type models. And a lot, of, a lot of good insights, which we'll, we'll touch a few of them. Okay, so we picked up basic contact modeling, just the inelastic model is the only one we did at all, but, um, and the idea of limit cycle stability. And we'll, we'll do some algorithms for it next time. Have a good spring break. We'll see you after that. Do 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 do